core elements that um, you have also seen in my, in my ISE steroids. And uh, so uh, today, I want to uh, show you a little bit how that works and what you can do with it. All right. What can I do? Hold it. Hold it, yeah. <laughs> Hold it. Well, that's the beauty about these presenters, uh, that you have one hand free for the microphone. Can, can you hear me in the back? OK, let's try it that way. So um, in this room, there's a personal hero, a couple of personal heroes, but one is Lee. Uh, thank you, Lee, for all the great work that you've done um, with this. And uh, I would like to, first of all, before I start, I wanted to point you to a couple of things. First of all, when you go to Power of the Shell now, you can download the preview. We also have a nice interview there done by Jeff. And um, I, there is a lot of resources um, that I would like to invite you to use. Uh, for example, I'm for four years now, I'm putting out a daily PowerShell tip, and you can see a couple of these here. It's all different stuff, how you can create tiny URLs, how you can find functions and stuff like that. <coughs> and we then compiled all these tips to a, a free ebook series. These are 12 ebooks. They're recipe oriented. It's uh, all downloadable at uh, PowerShell.com, XML, security, whatever you want. Um, and I just wanted to point that out because it's a lot of stuff here. Maybe you didn't even know that it exists. But I would like to talk about color TV now. Perfect. Basically, uh, when I was sitting in Avatar 3D <coughs> for the first time, that was my first 3D video, I was washed away. For me, that was really amazing. And I could anticipate what people must have felt when they switched their black and white TV sets to color <coughs> TV. So when you change that to color TV, you get a whole new impression. It's like a new dimension of information. And the same is true for PowerShell as well. Because you can take PowerShell code and put it into Notepad Editor. And I know a couple of you are still working that way. <laughs> That's OK if you have all that stuff in your head. But it's black, so you have no real information, just the code. Then there are gradients of color. For example, if you use uh, Power GUI or other editors, they will put in color. The same is true for blocks. When you block PowerShell code, you have plugins that colorize the code. But the code is sometimes off. For example, here you see a string, which is double quoted, and the variable inside of it is brown. So it's not really a live variable, although it should. So um, with these software, they have to sort of do the hard work themselves. They have to create parsers and parse the code by themselves. And since it's complex, they are sometimes off. When you take a look at the ISE, you'll see it's doing it right. Here's a double quoted <coughs> string, and the variable inside of it is still red because it's still an active variable. So the question is, how does the IC do this? And the uh, easy answer is, it doesn't. <laughs> it's simply going to PowerShell and asking the PowerShell parser, please tell me what the tokens are, and then I put color on them. And uh, today, what I want to do is talk a little bit about parsing, which is almost done. I want to dive into the real stuff discuss with you how you can get to the PowerShell parser, get that information, and write cool tools with this. Um, the PowerShell parser can be accessed in two different ways. Uh, before we do this, I need to uh, clarify a couple of, of terms. The parser, as you have seen yesterday, or the day before yesterday in my speech about parsing, is actually taking raw data and putting it into meaningful pieces. And these meaningful pieces are called tokens. A token is just one piece of information. And then there are, of course, errors. Errors are also pieces of information. When you see the red squiggly line with syntax errors, that is basically the colorization of these error tokens. And then you have something great that's called abstract syntax tree. The abstract syntax tree is taking groups of tokens and put them into perspective. So if you have structural elements like a loop or a condition or something like that, they consist, of obviously, of a number of tokens, like a brace and keywords. And that is reflected by the abstract syntax tree. And we want to get to all of this. So we want to create some tools uh, that use this information. There are two, two available interfaces that you can use. There's an old interface that is basically compatible to all PowerShell versions. And it returns 20 basic token types. That's not bad. Um, it'll tell you where the variables are, where the commands are, but it's a very basic interface. Beginning in uh, PowerShell 3, the team really opened these things up for us. So now we have the ability to uh, get to 137 fine-grained 
little tokens that give you all the information that you need about your script. <coughs> and you have also access to the abstract syntax tree. Now that's a little bit the theory behind it. And what I would like to do now is dive <coughs> with you into the PowerShell parser and give you a little bit of insight how you first get to the tokens and then to the AST and then what you can do with it. And um, we can talk about these things. <laughs> so I'll show you some code and then I would like to get in um, questions if you have some. Here, what you can see here is, here is my sample code. This is uh, just the one line of code that I would like to tokenize. And here I'm providing an empty variable. It's called errors, it could be called anything. Because when you ask the old parser for the tokens, it is returning those errors in a slightly unusual way. Developers know what, what's going on, but as a scripter, it's a little bit unusual. It's the ref uh, by reference addressing. So I'm basically <laughs> handing over an empty variable, and when I call this, the variable is then filled. <coughs> so it's basically doing it the reverse direction. Or when you at night go to a party, have a lot of beer, and sometimes people go around the corner and also have beer the reverse direction. That's basically <laughs> what this <laughs> is. So I get back, I hand in code, I get back errors, and I also get back the tokens. Garbage in, garbage out. Yes, that's basically it. <laughs> you get pictures and you had no uh, <laughs> <laughs> So when I take those tokens and show them in a grid view, grid view, you'll see what you get. I'll do that here, and obviously my code only had these elements in there a command token and a string token. But you can also see that the tokens um, contain very detailed information about where the tokens are in your text. So you could grab all the variables and find out where they are, make a list of them, make an inventory, or even more. So that is the first step. That's the old-fashioned, simple parser that's available in all the PowerShell versions. This is the error information. Very useful. You could write a tool that goes through all of your scripts on file and just uh, creates a list of those that have syntax errors in them. Here I can see it's a string missing the terminator. I do not see where the error is. So the code sample will show you how you get to that. Inside of each of these pieces of information, you always have an information that's called extend. And the extend is basically a set of information that tells you where does it start, where does it end, which line is it, which column is it. And when you put that into the error message as well, then you can see exactly where it happens. Start line one, end line one, start column 12, and so on. So you get all that information without actually having to run the code. You can do just a syntactical analysis using uh, the parser. So this is how it works here. I'm simply checking whether there are errors. <laughs> then I know there are errors on, or there are not errors. And if it has errors, I can output the errors. Then I do not have the location where the errors are. Or I can take the errors and access the token inside of it, and then simply use that as my information. Then I'm losing the error message. So I'm adding the error message to it. Basically, when you run that script or you step through it, you'll see that immediately how it works. That's one way of accessing the parser. It's a very rather simple thing. Now here's the same thing with a new interface. It's a slightly different type. It's called System Management Automation Language Parser and Parse Input. You have Parse Input and Parse File. So you can either submit text or a file that then automatically is read. When you look at the information that you get here, you'll see that, let me start this, you get back in principle the same type of information. I have here my two tokens in my sample code. But I have more information. I have token flags that tell me, is it a command name, or I in which language mode is it, um, use, uh, is it used? What kind of token is it? Uh, is there, that's very important. Is there an error in that token? <coughs> so I can immediately see, yeah, this one has an error. It was identified as an expandable string, but there was something missing. I missed the closing quote. So again, very much information that you can use. And if you wanted to, you could, in the same way that I illustrated before, add all the detailed information to it. Where does this token start? Where does it end? And uh, the same is true for the errors. You also get back the errors. And again, you can add all the different detailed information to the error. Where does it start? Where does it end? So this is not, well, 
not washing you away, it's simply giving you a first impression on how you get to that information. Now let's take a look at what we can do with it. Um, first of all, to compare those two different interfaces, I would like to take a look at <coughs> the different token types that they give to you. So what I did here was I was looking at the available token types that each of these interfaces um, makes available, the old token types and the new ones, like the old interface and the new interface, and then I, then I was doing a couple of comparisons. Basically, I want to show you the results. So these are the 20 old token types that you can expect from your old interface that is compatible to PowerShell 2. It's just 20 different tokens, the most basic tokens. If I do take the other interface, you'll see I have 147, oh, not 37, 47 tokens, and they are m much more detailed. You can find operators, you can find braces, opening braces, closing braces, all kinds of stuff that you can then use to create tools from that. <coughs> and then I did a comparison. What are the differences? Um, but I think um, it's, well, m it's uh, more rewarding to look at the same things, like what are the same things? These are the common names that you find in both interfaces. All the rest is different. I would, ex uh, well, I would recommend using the simple interface if you simply want to find variables or commands. If you want to do something sophisticated, and I'm going to show you uh, a baby obfuscator that sort of obfuscates your scripts uh, to protect your uh, intellectual property, uh, then you, of course, need more. So most of these scripts here are in, in the slides so that you can play with them later on. <coughs> now, let's assume I wanted to get a list of variables in my script. If you look at this, I'm defining this kind of uh, token type that I want, that I'm after, a variable. You've seen the list of available token types before. This time, I'm not using any sample code as a string. I'm simply accessing the ISE object model and reading the current editor text. Parse info has <coughs> two buckets where it sort of reverses its information, the errors and the token, because there's a third piece of information that it gets to me. That's the abstract syntax tree. I don't use the abstract syntax tree in this example. All I do is I take the tokens, and I want only those that have my kind, and then I output it. And that's what I want to do. So here I have a list of all my variables in my script, just like that. The column name gives me all the names of my variables. And then I have additional information, where can I find them? And if you think about it a little bit, this can be great for reporting. You can do auto doc documentation. You could even do tools that rename variables, refactor things like that. When you look at it, this is the basic code that you need to access tokens. I should create a function out of this. Uh, so that I can um, use different token types depending on what I want to do. And here in IC steroids, all I do is I select the code that I really want to reuse. That's the part that I want to reuse. And then I say refactor turn into function. So now I can create a function out of it. And I say get token. And here are the variables that I use inside <coughs> of my script. And I just choose the ones that should be public that should be parameters. Basically, what you see here is a user interface on top of that, what you've seen just a minute before. So it can be fun. It doesn't have to be, but it can be fun when you have a user interface. So this is the function. It's auto-created. It's an advanced function, get token. And if I run it, let's see if it works. Oh, let's clear this. Get token. I have here my kind, that's the variable, and I have here my different token types that's taken from the type. It was a strongly typed variable. So here I can immediately see all the different token types. And if I wanted to get, for example, curlies, left curly, out grid view, here are my left curlies. So I can look for anything in my script <laughs> and use that information to create refactoring tools. And then once the function works, you simply right-click the keyword function, export it to a module. Then you have it available everywhere. So that's really, then you have the full circle of automation. <coughs> OK, so that is the function, get token. I um, just put it to the sample so that you have it. 
And let's now see what we can do with these basic access uh, strategies. Can you also export the function to an existing module? If you want to, yes. You have a drop down, you can choose it. It has to be, of course, a script module. If you try and uh, export it to a binary module, it wouldn't work. In fact, the, the wizard really looks at only the modules that you created through the wizard. But of course, you can like, create a module, put in one function, and then next day, put in another function, another, so you can have different themes, different topics, <laughs> different modules, and, and organize your scripts that way. Let's create a variable inventory, and um, you can derive a lot of additional information and ideas from it. For example, <coughs> you could create a risk mitigation tool. For example, let's say you have to evaluate a script. You don't know if it's dangerous or not. And it's hard. There's no one telling you what the, the author of the script did. With the AST and the tokens, you could create a list of the commands and of the .NET members that are used in that script, and then sort out all the get commandlets because they are safe, and just get a list of all the potentially dangerous commands so you have one, one um, easy way of el evaluating the risk in a, in a script. Let's do that. Now, this is the harder part where you have the complete script. We don't need that anymore. We already have a function get token. You have seen just a minute ago how I created that. So I don't really need to access this parser again and look for variables and stuff. So instead, I could simply use my function, get variable, and then take out the name. So this would be my variable inventory. Well, it should be. Run it. Oh, I have to, well, get variable. No variable in here. Oh, it's true. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> Wait a minute. We need a variable. Hello. Test. Okay, there they are. So basically now you can create a list, you can sort it, you can <laughs> sort out the, um, the doubles by uh, specifying the parameter unique. And from here, the next step would be to rename variables. When you want to rename variables, you could look for all the different variables in your script, choose the one that you want to rename, look up all the locations where it is, and then re rename it. However, when you create tools that change your code, you'll have one cha challenge. The moment you change the first token in your script, all the offsets from the other tokens that follow will be off. Uh, if your variable, your new variable name is longer or shorter than, than the old one. However, an easy way to work around this is to just go from bottom up. If you reverse the order of your tokens and start at the bottom, then you don't mess up your offsets at all. And uh, another challenge though would be the AST gives you the information, however, really renaming things, renaming variables can be very hard. Here, for example, I'm showing you the challenge first. Let's see, oh, let's take in a parameter block. One parameter, and let's also um, use it here, and also maybe put it up here, and then access it, name, parameter, and maybe even access it through the object model. PS bound parameters contains key one. The reason why I'm showing you this is because renaming or refactoring scripts often break scripts, which is why, uh, because a variable can appear in different locations in different shapes. Here, yeah, I have one variable, <coughs> parameter one. It is also a parameter, so it shows up here too. I can use it in conjunction with commandlets. I can use it in conjunction with methods. So when I rename just the variable, my script breaks, obviously, because all of these other things then would match. So the AST can only be um, the provider of that information, and you need additional logic to figure out where this can all happen. That is um, what I put in, into IC steroids. So here, if you just click one of those variables and press F2, only the relevant parts will be selected. You can see the variable up there is not selected because it's a different scope. It's not the variable that I, that I um, selected with my cursor. But also, these instances are selected as well. And if I wanted to refactor this now, I could simply type test, 
and the script will be done. So that is basically what you can take out of the AST and the tokens. You can really develop clever logic, but you cannot as, um, expect the AST to, to miraculously do that for you. You just get the basic information about the structure of your script. <coughs> okay, let's go. The tokens are individual pieces of information and the AST is binding <coughs> them together. So if you want to have a broader overview of structures, where do I have a function? From where to where does the function go? Or when you want to have a selection tool where you can select the functions and copy them to the clipboard or to a module, for example. When I exported the function to a module, I asked, I asked the AST for that function and then copied that as a source code to the module. Then you can take the AST. The AST is used to find yeah, syntactical groups. And that's what I want to show you now, how you can access the AST, exploring the AST. <coughs> It is basically the very same script, the very same script that I used before, except before I ignored this part. I just ignored the AST. This time I'm outputting it and showing you what it is. So I'm running this now. Let's uh, do it like <coughs> this. And this is what you get back. And I'll show you where it comes from in a second. These are the different AST structures that you can find in that script. So this time, we're not talking about individual keywords. These are syntactical things. I have an assignment. I have a command. I have a command expression, which would be a command plus parama parameters and arguments. A pipeline. All these metadata, if you want, uh, are now um, accessible. And this is how I did this. <coughs> when you ask the parser to parse your code, you get back the AST for the entire parent script block. That doesn't give you much information. The secret really is, and, and it is not very intuitive, you need to know that code, would be this line here. You're basically taking the AST and using that method, find all. Find all can then recursively search for all the children, like the child AST structures. And this tells the function or the method that it should really go recursively. If you set that to false, it'll be in that level and not recurse into deeper structures. And this here is it's a script block. It's just a piece of <coughs> PowerShell code. In this case, this is a delegate. It's basically some code that PowerShell or this method evaluates each time that it meets an AST. And then it executes that. It's basically like the guy at the door at the discotheque who's deciding, can you go in or not? So that is basically the rule that, that this guy is applying. And the rule here is true, which means I want to see everything. Just give me every single AST. It's always OK. At that point, you can also put in a condition and really only return certain ASTs, only if conditions, only functions. It's up to you what kind of condition you want to put in here. But for this sample, it will give you the entire structure of your script. So this one here <coughs> is a different approach. Here, I say again, find all, but this time I have a condition, a specific condition. I'm saying arc. Arc is a variable that's already there. That's the AST that is being evaluated. Is arc of the AST type that I'm after? I'm not saying true all the time. I want to see if it is a system management automation language command expression AST. So I want only the command expressions. And if I do that, I ran it already. Commands. Oh, no commands in here. Damn. Run it again. <coughs> no commands? I don't believe that. Let's just take a pipeline. You can take any of the, of the uh, types that you've seen before that are available. That's a strange. Hello. Did I? Okay, I get that. Hmm. Let me show you the same sample in a in a an, in a use case. I don't know why I cannot find right now the right one. 
let's simply take, first of all, a list of the available ASTs, and then we'll return to that example. So I'm going here to the same, I'm going here to an, a, one of the ASTs that are possible, an array expression, for example, going to the assembly that defines this type, and then I want to know what, what other types are in that assembly, because I want a list of all the different available AST types that I could possibly use for filtering. Then I'm looking for only the types that end with AST, and the result would be something like this, clip exe. It's in my clipboard now. So in my clipboard, these would be a list of all the different ASTs that are available. Now you're looking a little bit concerned, and I can see your concern because I'm showing you a couple of things, and um, it, it has a slight complex touch to it. But there's now a function that I wanted to give to you that basically automates that process for you, except that I simply just killed my ISE, open it again, project, back in the grace. So what I did was I was taking that list and using it as a validate set. So these are the different ASTs that I can use. <coughs> and then the rest is simply getting the, the logic, or is the logic to get that specific AST. I'm simply asking PowerShell to give me the ASTs of the, of the type that I wanted. So in this case, I get back a lot of pipeline elements because what I, what I did here was I was asking for the AST type pipeline. If I wanted to, something, wanted to get something else, like the function, let's say I want to have all the functions in my script. All I needed to do would be now to say get AST, and then AST type, here are the different types, and now I can say function, put it to the output view, and this is my function, get AST, it's the only function I have. Also, I get the source code in the function, but a lot more information, where it starts, where it ends, the extend. So with this function, get AST, you don't have to really fiddle with the low-level stuff. You have now two functions, get token and get AST, that give you all the, uh, the information that you may need for your tooling. And that leads me to <coughs> a little project. Before we can start the project, so you've seen ASTs <coughs> and tokens both <coughs> return and extend that tells me where the structure can be found. And um, I can use that code that I want to analyze either from file, I can read it in, or I can uh, provide it as text, that doesn't matter. If I want to take it out of the ISE, I can use this special variable. And now I want to make some changes. Like I said, making changes is a little challenge, since with your changes, the offsets change. And like I said, the solution, uh, the easy solution would be simply to go reverse order from bottom to top. What I would like now to do with you together is create a little tool that obfuscates all the variables in a script. So what it does is it simply takes a list of all the variables that you have in a script, create a GUID as a random number, and use that as a replacement for all the different variables. That is only a, like, like a little scenario, it's not production quality. You can break scripts. You have seen how complex it may be to uh, really rename variables, but it's just um, a little thing that we can uh, use to, to see the power of that. So this is a baby obfuscator. It's not a full-blown professional obfuscator. Don't use it with your production scripts right away. They may break. <coughs> so here's a script that I want to obfuscate. It's the WMI Explorer. It's a large script. See, it's fairly large. Let's see if it works. It works, hopefully. Yeah, it connects. So now it still works. Now I'm loading a <coughs> my baby obfuscator. Now, showing you the code in a second. And now I want to obfuscate that script and uh, so that you can better see what's going on. I am adding the script map. So here I have a script map with my script, and you can see now in a second how it'll be changed. The, the command is convert to obfuscated. Well, convert to 
<coughs> obfuscation. One thing before I start this, it'll work, but um, since this is simply accessing the object model of the ISE, and since PowerShell is a really large script, is going to parse the script each time I do a little change in it, it'll at the end become a little <coughs> bit slower. Okay, now I'll start it. As you can see, it'll work its way up. And um, now it's getting a little bit slower. <coughs> You can see it's turning black. Black means the parser is currently parsing it all the time, so there's no real chance for the tokens to show <coughs> up. And that's what I meant. It just hang in there, it just takes a while. There are better ways and more, op more um, optimized ways to do this, like IC Sturts does it differently, locks the whole thing while it's changing things. But you could do it, you can have a coffee now. And then after a while, uh, the script looks a little bit different. Um, the command will take the script that is open in that tab. Yeah. It is basically asking the ISE for the current script and taking that script code, and that's it. Okay, now it's done. And as you can see, now the colors are back. The color TV is back <coughs> because now the, there was enough time for the tokens to be created. And the script itself looks really a little bit different. It's harder to understand, which <laughs> is basically the idea behind the whole thing. Let's see if it still works. Yeah, still works. Which is by pure coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> because as you've seen, um, if, if Mo, who created this, would have used parameters, then the parameters would not have necessarily been renamed by this very simple approach. Now, if I um, apply the fixer to it, then it'll be all aligned to. Uh, okay. And that would be a first step to build on to create your own tooling sets or to protect things or document things. Now it's all aligned. Let's take a look at how that worked. I have two functions here. Get token is the function that I introduced initially that is simply getting the tokens that you have in your script code. So I'm simply using that as a tool. This is the real function. What I do is I ask for just the variable tokens. That's easy enough now, since I don't have to fiddle with the parser anymore. Then I sort it in a different direction. Because, like I said, I have to do the replacements from bottom to top. I need a cr criteria how I can sort. And the criteria would be the extent. I want the offset of the token. I want to, be, uh, want to take the last token first. So I'm using sort object with the calculated property. That is the different token that I want to sort. Inside of extent, I have the start offset. That is the crit criteria I want to use for sorting. And of course, I sort descending so that I get the bottom tokens up. And then I have a little loop. That's it. I have my tokens. I have this loop. I have a hash table, which I use as a lookup table. Because each time I find a new variable, I need to create a GUID. And each time I find a variable that I already have, I need to use the GUID that I had before, so that all the variables keep their names. And down <coughs> here, that is the process of changing your script. Again, PSISE is your entry to the ISE object model, and you have the current file editor, which would be the current editor. And now this would be the way how you can change code. You select the part that you want to change, which is just the same kind of information that the token gives to you. So that wants to know exactly, basically, the extent from where to where do you want to select things. So I put in the extent of the uh, existing variable, and I replace this with the lookup variable name. That is basically the same thing that you would use for renaming variables as well. If you want to <coughs> rename it, basically that is renaming variables, except that you did not have a chance to pick a new name, <laughs> that uh, it picked it for you. So um, in essence, what that means is that accessing the AST and tokens can be quite complex if you need to do it from scratch. But with the functions that I introduced to you, get token and get AST, it is fairly easy. And then all you need to do, and that if you like to do some tools in PowerShell, all you would need to do next would be take the sample code, play with it. Take a look at the tokens and the object model. It's really straightforward. You have the extent, which gives you the, the dimension, and then you can simply exchange whatever you want. 
So in summary, we have seen there's a PowerShell parser which does basically the same thing that you did with the parsers two days ago, except that this time it's not XML or CSV, it's PowerShell code. And this parser knows how to interpret it. Then we have these two things, tokens. They are individual keywords and the AST. That is the structure, the group of tokens that build structures. Question? Is this limited to the ISC, or can we use it as well in the? You can use it anywhere. You can use it in a normal PowerShell as well. Um, basically, the parser is accepting raw text. So you could create a dir command, dir recursively through your whole server, get all the PowerShell scripts, get, a con get content on them, and check each one of them. And then make a list of all the syntax errors that you found. So it's basically uh, not tied to the IC at all. Um, and uh, with the AST, as you have seen, you need this one secret line of code with the find all method that enables you to, to dive into that abstract syntax tree. Okay, basically, I'm really good in time, so that we really have some time to play if you want to. I have something to play with uh, because it's some sort of flaw. I belong to the, I belong to the uh, group of people who like to have their opening and close best squirrelies on top of each other. Right. Yes, but to, to show you why that is, I can show you that. Not the A list for each or no, the problem is uh, if, for example, is a structure where you, the, the syntax uh, sort of allows this kind of design. With for each, it's a <laughs> commandlet. That's nothing more or less than a commandlet. And when you now have a curly brace, that is basically an argument to a parameter. And the parameter is process. process. So basically, when you now take that to the next line, what's happening here is that for each object thinks you were missing the argument. That's the reason why you can't do it. You would have to put a back tick here just to tell PowerShell that it, it is continued in the next line. Or put differently, a back tick always invalidates the next character. So it would invalidate the line feed. That way, the line would extend. But there, syntactically, the language wouldn't allow you to um, just write a parameter and, and not supply the argument in the same line. But I mean, PowerShell should be smart enough to realize there's more coming. Right? <laughs> That's no. what they say every time. Smart <laughs> enough to know there's more coming, so you can just put it on the next line. That is true, but then again, like it, maybe you want to do it on purpose. Maybe you really want to have a script block in the next line. But if you do where object, it works, for example. So. No, it wouldn't. Wait a minute. One to goals. ten. Exactly. Where object? And now let's say like that. Uh, only the uneven numbers. That doesn't work. It, it, syntactically, it's okay, but it doesn't give the result that you want. Or you just bought yourself a beer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's asking for the property. It's basically wanting the parameter, and. If you, for example, you could have fooled yourself into m m thinking that it works if you do it like this. Well, it's still asking for the property. Yeah, Maybe you have partial it's seven. It's not your ISD steroids that's doing that? No, 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 no. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, I'll, I'll, st I'll start. I start it like this. <laughs> Let's do it like this. This is a naked one. <laughs> Let's do it like this. Now this is, is just a naked, no profile, nothing changed ISE. So let's put it like that. Bare bone. Bare bone, yeah. See, same thing. <laughs> but talking about this, um, when, if you don't want to start from scratch with the AST, and if you like aligned braces and all this kind of stuff, then um, you probably have seen that if I, let's put it this way, if I have something in here like this, hello, test. Oh, you see automatic alignment? It's putting that to the right. Now, if you wanted, to, it, just imagine this was a large script. Then you here have um, um, an adaptable um, access to your AST and um, tokens. If I don't want to worry at all, I simply press this button. And then you'll see that the, 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 the braces are not aligned under each other. But you have here an advanced section with all the different scripts that do this. 
these are open scripts. You can take a look at those. For example, if you look at character operations and then here convert illegal characters, right click that, open that script, and yeah, I know what I'm doing. Then you, as you can see, here are the Unicode characters and the replacements. Here are the ASCII codes <coughs> and replacements. So you can do whatever you want. You can extend it if you want to. And the curly brace thing is simply another piece of script. It's here in script block. And you can see align braces except one liner, align braces including one liner, and remove empty lines. And then you can check the ones that you want. Some are mutually exclusive, like this one. And you can then run the whole enchilada. Or you can say, well, I just want to run my script block. Let's see. Including one liners, OK. And I want to just apply that. Oh, and it didn't work. Let's do the other <coughs> way. Why is it not OK? Let's put it a little bit different. It's, it's a script, and the question is what the script does. <laughs> let's put it this way, including one liner. OK, let's put it this way. No changes. No changes. Um, well, don't know. Um, I have to look at it when I'm not in front of you, because uh, this makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But it is an extensible thing that where you can put in um, any kind of script that you want in addition to, the to those that are there. Let's just take a look at maybe one of these. Uh, let's take <coughs> case correct command parameter names. And what you see here is basically it's going through all the commands that you have in your script. And it is getting, basically, from um, IC steroids, the AST for commands already. So you don't need all that script stuff that I showed you before. But you could do it all on your, on your own if you wanted to. And um, when you click something, these um, optical guidances here, these are basically visual representations of the AST. So you, can see, you see here is your token. And this um, line is your AST that you're currently in. And Bartek was talking about this clever selection thing. That is AST based as well. If you click a command, it'll tell you here what it is. It's a <coughs> command in pipeline. And when you now press Control Q, you select the token. Press it again, you select the next structure, which would be a command. It's up down here. Then you have the pipeline. Then you have the statement block. Then you have the if statement, and so on. So you can go by AST steps. That's basically illustrating what AST and tokens can do. OK, uh, more questions. What would be AST tool, or what would be language-based or refactoring tools that you want? <coughs> I see steroids. <laughs> okay. You're heading in resharper style territory then. Uh, That's like where you're going with this, right? That you sort of, yeah, that you can automatically change the structure of your script. And it keeps you right, because the, the develop, most of our developers in C-sharp land are swear by resharper, so it makes them much more productive. And we have templating set up to choose which sets of rules that we're going to go apply to the code. Yeah, that's basically what you see here, the open architecture, so that anyone, there's no one taste. One likes them aligned, the next one wants them right after the command, whatever. There are thousands of different tastes, and that's why it's an open structure. So uh, yeah, from a uh, project uh, branching and merging style scenario, we want them to try and keep to the same layout so that it makes merging the code back in. That is basically the idea here. Um, so once you have, for example, refactored a script to your company standards, what you then could do is simply, um, let's say it's saved. It's a script, test one. Then you could, for example, have someone authorize it. Here's a little symbol down here, so you can apply a signature to it. Let's say this one. And then you have a signature in there. And now, if, if you set up your environment right, then you could make sure that production scripts are always validated by some people who did the quality control or the structures. OK. All right, question. Yes, um, that's true. Like red squiggles are always bad. <laughs> but if they're not red, then you can ignore them if you want to. And basically, the idea behind it is when you click a squiggle, it'll tell you in the status bar what's wrong. Like I can see here, should be single quoted. And then if I want to fix it, I can say, OK, fix it. 
or if you use an alias again it works but it's not best practice so if uh, you click here on the squiggle you can simply fix it um, and that's that's learning by doing it uh, for example if you have a function and you put the parameters after it a b c the vb script style you can do that but now it's a green squiggle green squiggle means well blue squiggle is you should should care about it green squiggle is simply well it's not that important. When you click on this, it, it just says it's an inconsistent syntax because this syntax is not compliant <laughs> with the uh, script syntax. In a script, you have a parameter block. So if you want to have it consistent, you should do the same thing in a function too. So when I click here on fix now, it simply puts it into a parameter block. And so now you have the parameter. So basically, while you're working on it, the squiggles give you a little clue. If you don't like that, you can always right click the squiggle and say, shut up. And then it's next time it's gone. Uh, I have to probably <laughs> next time it's gone. Okay, not now. Next time you open it. So you, when you want different syntax, you have to edit. You have to edit the script. Is it possible to create a, a company syntax profile and have all the uh, same people use it? Yes, of course, because basically that is the profile that you can see here. Um, wait. That you can see here, that is basically a set of scripts that are residing in, in a folder. And if you if you share those scripts among your team, then they all use the same set of of scripts and can all, with a click of a button, refactor their stuff. Yeah, so you have to distribute those among everybody who uses it. Yes, that's basically your freedom, but also your requirement to have these things and adjust them to the way how you want them. Okay. It's also possible to use the voucher pass to pass other languages like Perl or Python? Uh, well, it is possible. It's, uh, the limit is the time <laughs> to, to implement it. Um, basically, you can extend it to any kind of language. Like IC already has different languages. It, it supports XML. <coughs> so if you open an XML file, you have also a parser for that and colorization and stuff. So it is doable, but would require quite a lot of work. So if you want a general purpose editor, probably the Sapien editor is perfect because it has so many different languages. If you want one that dives really into one specific language, then the ISE with its extension is probably the way to go. My personal opinion. If you hadn't pressed ignore that one, would it, when you did a run out, would it have made that into a parameter block? No, uh, the, the squiggles simply are there to give you a clue where you need to manually decide what you want. You could do that. If you wanted to, you could put, put it in there. For example, I did add a couple of rules that look like this. Uh, let's say new item, or oh, let's not take new item. I don't want to mess up my system. Um, out null. You all know this. This would destroy the results, right? Out null is simply a null device. If you now do the fixing, it'll look like this afterwards. So what it does is it changes it to dollar null equals. So it takes away out null and puts the dollar null variable to the beginning because it's 40 times faster. So it's also performance enhancements. And it also added the positional parameter that was missing. But that is completely up to you what kind of rules you want to stick in there. You can change anything. Uh, the argument location. It, no, uh, it, it, it adds missing parameters. That's what it does. So if, if you didn't have much time, but your customer wants a real script, and you just did something like that, and want to give it to your customer, then the last thing you do would be click this. And then after a while, you get the formally correct partial statement. Mm -hmm. See when it's doing these performance tweaks, are there any kind of inline comments to tell you that it's made a performance tweak? Because some other tools <coughs> I've seen would do that to give you an idea of what best practices are. No, uh, well, the only indication after you run this is the green stuff. So it'll tell you exactly where it did change something. And um, then you would have to use version control. Like if I go back one step to the original one, let's put what did, oh, like this one. Do this, dir, take this away, n r. So uh, let's assume this was a larger script, test, 
too. <coughs> and I added a major version. So I saved that state, and now I'm sort of um, fixing it. And then I go back to my version control and do another major version. I want to see where the differences are. Then I would ne really need to do it like that. And then I can see exactly what it changed from version X to, to Y. But there's no, no list that it creates for you. But you're looking, okay, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm giving the scripts and the presentation to Richard, and you will get them eventually. Okay, thank you very much.